Okay, well good morning everyone and thank you for joining us today. My name is Tom West, Head of Operations at PLS. Joining me are my colleagues Suzanne Bainan, Publisher Relations Manager and EVE and ED, Communications and Events Assistant, both of which I imagine you will have uh, had contact with at some point uh, in the not, not too distant past. During today's session I'll be providing a practical run through of PLSE, our Accounts Management Service, identifying the key areas that you need to be aware of when managing your account with PLS and providing tips for how to get the best out of your relationship with PLS and collective licensing in general. Before we get started, there are a few housekeeping points to flag. The audio for this session is available through your computer speakers or by calling in by phone. If you're experiencing poor sound quality using your computer speakers, you may want to try dialing into the session by phone. To do this, in your control panel on the right-hand side, under audio, select telephone and dial the number shown and use the access code and audio pin shown when instructed. Now, participants will remain muted throughout the session. However, on the right-hand side of your screen, you will see the control panel, which includes a questions box. Please write any questions or comments you have throughout the session into the questions box, which we will be monitoring throughout. We will also have an open question session at the end. If at any point you experience difficulties with your local inter internet connection, for example, and find yourself no longer in the webinar, once the connection has been re-established on your end, you'll need to log back into the webinar. If you do miss anything, please note that a video recording will be available in due course afterwards. For any other technical issues, please use the questions box to let us know. We may not be able to help with everything, but we'll certainly help where we can. So for this webinar, we're going to assume a basic level of understanding about who we, PLS, are and what we do as an organisation. If you are unfamiliar with the basics, it will still be relevant, but do get in touch afterwards to find out about the next introductory session. So let's start at the beginning. What is PLSE? PLSE is the PLS's account management service and every publisher signed up with us automatically has an online account which enables you to manage your participation in collective licensing. It's how you update your contact details, your title lists, your licensing settings and monitor licensing revenue. For these reasons, it's important that there's at least one person within your organisation that understands how it works and what's required. It shouldn't take too much of your time throughout the year. I think one of the key principles of collective licensing is that it doesn't require much administration from you, but with a basic knowledge you can ensure that you do what's necessary to, to keep things ticking over. So we're delighted that, that so many of you have taken the time out of your day to join this webinar. Now before we get into the detail, I'd like to start off with where your account fits in with the bigger picture. And it begins with you as the publisher providing title data and licensing settings into PLSE. PLSE then communicates details of those titles, or what we sometimes refer to as your repertoire, and your licensing settings to the agents CLA and NLA. NLA represent magazines in business and government sectors. CLA, which is the default setting when you sign the account form, is for magazines in business and government, but also journals, books, and in education sectors licensing as well. Now these agents in turn provide licensees with legit legitimate access to copy from extracts from your publications in exchange for a license fee, which they pay back to those agents, and they then pass that back to PLS uh, through PLSE, along with details of which titles have been used and therefore of accrued licensing revenue. That information and, and, and the payments are then made by PLSE, by PLS, back to you, the publisher. So you can see here that PLSE really plays an integral part, a central part of the entire collective licensing process. So let's move on to the account. Now usually you would access the account through our, uh, the public website and those of you, most of you will probably have logged in by now, uh, will be familiar with that. What I'm, I'm going to be doing for today is to sign in through our, our demo account.
So once you sign in, you'll you'll see a an account homepage. All of the various sections of your account can be accessed via this page, and it's a good starting point to give uh, to provide you with a simple overview of the various parts of your accounts, uh, which I'll come to in a second. Whether it's managing your titles, um, checking your licensing revenue, managing your licensing settings, and you can see here that you've got various links explaining uh, the various parts of your account. I think once you're more familiar with using your PLSC account, you're probably more likely to use the top-level navigation, um, which has access to the same sections, um, and you can basically hop hop into those sections a lot quicker. And these are the it's this horizontal top-level navigation that I'm going to be using uh, for most of the, the presentation today. Wherever you see a camera icon, clicking on that will bring you a slide where you can basically click through to get an overview of the relevant section. In this case, it's a general overview of your PLSE account. And to be honest, it's going to cover a lot of what, what we're talking about today. So it's, so it's there in perpetuity for you to use. Now, the first thing that you might want to do when you log into your account is, is, is probably change your password. And to do this, if you click on your account details on the right-hand side, you, you will see your personal account details. You'll be able to change your password. And you'll be also be able to update various details um, about yourself, whether it's an email address, uh, your job title, etc., etc. And I'm not going to dwell on this for the session. Most of the session, we're going to be moving on to licensing settings and licensing revenue. Similarly, under contact details, under company details, you can provide information, you can update your address, address details, etc. So all the usual account management stuff. Now, as you saw with the licensing process that we run through a second ago, the basic model and tenets of collective licensing are pretty simple. And I think this is reflected again in your account, which comprises three core components. Titles, licensing settings, and licensing revenue. The basic premise being that you upload or update your titles, apply licensing settings to those titles, and then let us do the rest. And then, uh, providing those titles are used and, and are recorded as being used, you will receive licensing revenue based on the data collected by CLA and NLA. So let's have a look at each of these sections in turn, starting with titles. So these are the publications that are identified as yours for the purposes of collective licensing. And basically, it's as comprehensive a list as you're able to provide. Any titles ever published by your organization that have not been sold or di divested. Um, for book publishers, this will include titles where rights may have reverted to the author. This may strike you as unusual, but under the terms of your PLS agreement, because of our unique partnership with the Authors' Organization, the Authors' Licensing and Collecting Society, you're entitled to a share of revenue, whether the rights have reverted or not. And you'd be surprised at sometimes the, the age of the titles that are actually used under collective licensing, um, a lot of the time because they're not available um, to purchase and therefore there's more of a, a, an impetus for the, for the licensee to photocopy or, or scan from the pub, extracts from the publication because it's not available to buy. Under titles, we also include websites, and website licensing was introduced in 2008, 2009, and again, this is where you can update details of your websites and receive revenue for those. Now, revenue allocated to any of these titles linked to your account, identified by the ISBN, the ISSN, or URL, will be paid to you. And while I've said that we ideally want this comprehensive list from you as possible, if you have a look at your account, maybe after this session, and, and notice that there are titles missing, please don't worry that you may have missed out on revenue. The way it will work is that providing the title in question has your ISBN or ISSN, or indeed URL. If a title appears as being used under a CLA or NLA license, we will um, identify the, 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 the owner of that title and uh, link the title to your account. So, how do you update your 
or add to your title list? Well, there are three ways. The most obvious way is clicking on add title on the right hand side of your page. If you click that button, it's simply a question of adding the title, the ISBN or ISSN, the imprint, publication type, whether it's a book or a serial, and whether it's a print or a digital publication, and then clicking save, and that will add the title. If you've got a number of titles to add, a, a, a large volume, maybe an, an entire list or a, a list that you've acquired, you can do this by clicking on the Upload Books Serials uh, section under Titles. This will provide you with a step-by-step -step guide to how to upload your titles in this way. And there are two ways of doing it. One is to use, uh, if you're a book publisher, to set up an Onyx feed. You could set up this to run um, in an automated way as frequently as you like. Some publishers give us Onyx feeds on a daily basis. Um, weekly, monthly, quarterly is perfectly sufficient. The other way of doing it is via Excel. So we have an, uh, an upload Excel section. And if you click on the link here, this will open a template which will give you access to a form to fill in, paste in the details, and uh, click an upload button, and that will upload those, those titles to your account. Now, once the titles have been uploaded, you will get confirmation through a tool that we have called PLSE Assist, and you'll see this with the, the hand icon in the top uh, right-hand corner of your screen. And it will appear under the title upload section. PLSE Assist will also notify you if any titles that you have tried to upload are linked to another publisher in our system. This will sometimes happen when, for example, the previous publisher has not notified us of, of the change in ownership. Perhaps they've sold a title to you but haven't told us about it. And let's have a quick look at how this works. So the process begins when you're notified that an upload has been completed that you'll see in title uploads. If a title on that upload is linked to another publisher, you will see this in Outgoing Title Request section here. Now you can see uh, with this example uh, that you have tried to add a title, A Brief History of the Americas, which is currently published by a publisher, Atlanta Books, and that the status is pending. Atlanta Books, in the meantime, will have received a notification about that title through their PLSE Assist section under Incoming Title Requests, asking them to either approve or reject the request. If they approve it, the title moves across to your account and the pending status in your inbox changes to Approved. If they reject it, the title does not move and the pending status in your inbox changes to Rejected. Looking at this the other, the other way round, in incoming title requests, for this illustration, we've got a title called The History of Cambridge. A publisher, Century Press, has tried to add this title to their account. You now need to decide whether to approve by this button or reject the request. Or, if you would like more information, you can send a comment to them directly through the system asking for clarification before deciding what action to take. And the way that you do this is clicking the highlight box on the right-hand side, clicking on send comment, and then you can add a comment um, which will be sent to them. If I click send you can see that the comment appears here and it will appear for them um, in, in, in the similar section of their inbox. And basically you can go back and forth with the publisher until you've actually established um, who owns that particular title. Now once requests have been resolved, they can be archived using the archive request button. 
These are stored for future reference in perpetuity, which includes any conversation that you've had with the other publisher. Uh, so the feature of that is that you always have a record of why a title moved either to your account or off your account. If you need to keep track of particular requests, perhaps because a number of people within your, within your organization will be managing your account, you can actually add a tag again by selecting the box on the right hand side, click add tag, adding a tag and click add and a reason and clicking apply and you can see here that it appears in the task tags uh, section on the right hand side um, with the description um, and who added the tag so you've got complete control over um, managing it's, it's kind of like a virtual post-it note I guess in a way uh, to keep track of the requests um, obviously when you've only got a few requests it's not so necessary but if you've got a fairly large number this can be a really useful uh, uh, tool available to you so I think the thing to say about PLSE Assist is do keep an eye out for requests that may need your attention the box in the right hand side will turn red if there's something that needs an update and also if you're set up you can under communications preferences for you as a contact you can set a uh, ticker box which means that you receive PLSC assist emails whenever there is a change to that that that, that section um, so you're not having to constantly check back into your account to see if there's been an update Okay, so you've got the title list sorted, it's all uploaded. Uh, I now want to talk about a few tools that are available for you to manage your titles. So on the books and serials page, there are a couple of functions to be aware of. The first, most obvious, is being able to search multiple titles at one, one, one time. So what I'm going to do is paste in some ISBNs or ISSNs into um, a box here which can be found by clicking on options next to the search box. If I then click search it will bring up just those titles and you're able to search for titles up to 100 at, 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 a, at any given time. Another feature that we have here is the ability to, we have a, a link with the bibliographic data service Bowcub which means that if you're searching for a title and you're not sure, and this is with regards to books, and you're not sure whether the title's on your account, if you search, if you tick the other box, which is search PLSC and external data sources, click search, you can see here that the title hasn't been found on your account, it's not in your repertoire, but if we click on the second tab, you can see that it's been found in through the Bowker search, and assuming that I'm confident that I own the rights to this title. I can tick the box here, click on import, you get a pop-up just warning you that you need to make sure that you own the rights to that title, and then click yes. And the title will be added to your account once you've decided on which imprint you want it added to. So this is quite a, a neat tool for, for adding titles to your account very quickly and easily. The next tool that's available uh, is the apply filter hidden away here and this gives you an overview of the, the, the different categories of titles on your account and again certainly for book publishers or publishers with, with, with um, a large title list it will give you quite a nice overview of the titles that you've got on your account um, and you can click on these filters in order for example to just get the serials and just look at the serials that are linked to your account. And then finally, the, um, one of the themes that we'll come back to in a second is, is being able to tag titles. So there'll be certain circumstances where you'll need to identify specific groups of titles according to your own criteria, whether these are subject category, a specific author perhaps, a specific division of your company, uh, and a new, or a new list acquired which enables you to apply licensing settings to that group of titles or to report on income for those titles. So let's just have a quick look at this. 
again, I'm going to use the same ISBNs and ISSNs that I've got here. We're going to search for them. You then select all of the titles by selecting the tick box at the top. Click Add Tags. Add a tag name. Click Add. And then add a comment. click apply and you'll see here that it appears in the top right hand corner of the page under title tags again with information about who created the tag when they created it and why they created it and you can set up as many tags as you want you can set up multiple tags for single titles Now we'll come back to this feature in uh, in a few minutes' time. Wherever you see the export function, this will give you, as it suggests, uh, the ability to export the data that you see on the page into an Excel spreadsheet. So, for example, with titles, if you've got a, a large title list, click on export, and it will export all, all of those details into a spreadsheet, which, you know, for example, if you've got a colleague that you want to have a look at the titles that you've got on your account, perhaps, perhaps specific divisions, um, you can do that by exporting them and then sending them on to that colleague. Okay, let's, before we move on, let's have a quick recap then. So, Titles covers books, serials, and websites. It's important that we have as comprehensive a list of your titles on your account as you are able to provide. Titles can be added individually via Onyx feed, via Excel upload, or by pulling in from the advanced search uh, using the Balco service. Tagging provides an easy way to group titles for various uses. And the PLSE Assist function handles title transfers between publisher accounts. What I would say with PLSE Assist is that we do have a help section that will take you again step by step explaining um, what I've said and, uh, and a bit more about exactly how the service works. So don't worry if you've missed if you've missed certain aspects of that. So titles on your account all up to date. Perhaps you've tagged some of them. Now it's over to PLS and the licensing agents to try and make some money for you. So let's look next at how you see how your titles are being licensed and your control over that licensing. And you do this through licensing settings. Now this section is made up of CLA licenses overseas and if you're signed up through NLA you also see an NLA tab in this section. Let's, have, let's start off with CLA then. So this main licensing page provides you with a simple overview of the inclusion of your titles in CLA licenses with a traffic light type system. A green tick means that you're fully included. An orange tick or an amber tick um, shows that you're partly included and there may be a reason why, um, whether it's that you haven't opted into certain parts of the license, maybe you haven't opted in your digital repertoire or perhaps you've excluded titles. And then a red cross means that you're not included at all in that license. If you click on a tick, it will give you a, a, just a neat overview of your participation in that particular license. If we click on the amber tick below for the law license, you can see um, that the digital repertoire, your digital content isn't opted in. And also that you've got a, a one title that's ex been excluded from the license. And if I click on that title exclusion, it will then take me through to the particular title that's been excluded so I can understand um, uh, and, and, as I say, get an overview of, 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 of the settings that I have at, at, at that detailed license level. Now going back to the main page, it's a fairly obvious point, but the, the, the principal way to ensure that you get the most from your PLS agreement is to ensure that your titles are fully included ideally with green ticks all the way down, even for licenses that you think may not be relevant to your organization. It costs nothing to be included in the licenses. 
So wherever you see an amber tick, you can hover over it, see why it isn't green, and hopefully take action accordingly. And obviously, where you see a red cross, unless there's a very persuasive business uh, reason for you not to have opted in, um, we would advise you to, to look very carefully at that and hopefully opt into that license. As I've just shown you, clicking on any of the, the licenses in question will give you, will drill down to more detail. So you can see here for the business license, it gives you a very clear overview at, at a high level of what this license is all about, what repertoire is included, the extent limits, i.e. that only up to 5% of a work, a single chapter or a single law report, etc., can be copied. And if you're in interested in even more information, then if you click on full license documentation, this will take you through to the CLA, to, to the licensing agent themselves, where you can get very detailed information right down to the terms and conditions that are made available to the licensees. If you want to amend your participation in the license, and let's go back to that law license for example, if you click on the license, click on edit, I can then opt in my digital repertoire, click save, and you can see you've got a green tick there. I can do exactly the same for the multinational extension, and again, it will opt me in. The reason I'm still seeing an amber tick is obviously because I've still got that title that, that's been excluded. I can remove that by selecting the title and clicking remove, and then everything changes to green, I'm fully included. Now most of the licenses are what we call blanket licenses in that a licensee pays an annual fee that can copy publications within the license repertoire and set within set limits without having to clear or pay or clear permissions each time. However, there are some licenses that work on a transactional or pay-per-use basis where you can set rates that users pay to reuse your content. Main example in the UK licensing is the document delivery service and also the recently launched top-up service for the CLA higher education sector, second extract permissions. To see pricing that currently applies on the CLA page, and let's look at document delivery for example, you can either click on show prices or if you click on the tick, you'll see the prices that apply there. Now the basic model for pricing for all of these transactional licenses is that you set a top or base rate. This is the rate that appears um, here and will apply to all of the titles that are linked to your account except any that you may wish to decide to set title specific pricing for. So for example, you may have very high value titles uh, and you want to set a different price for those, for those particular titles. So if we click on document delivery license, scroll down to title specific pricing, and this is one of the main uses of tagging, so I can either search for an individual title that I want to set a different price for, or I can click on the tag, bring up those titles, select a title that I want to price, click set title specific pricing, click apply, add a price, be 30 pounds an article, click apply again, and this will appear under t current title specific pricing on the, on the tab to the left hand side, and you can see here, Modern Britain has now been priced at 30 pounds an article. So that's UK licensing, that's CLA licensing. We're now going to have a look at overseas licensing. So, your agreement with PLS not only covers you for licensing in the UK, but also overseas, and this is enabled through a network of agreements that CLA has with Overseas Reproduction Rights Organisations, or RROs. 
What this means is that licensing revenue can be paid to you whenever it is due from overseas licensing. To put overseas licensing in a bit of context, last year it accounted for almost 20% of total distributable PLS revenue, so it is a significant source of income for some publishers. Some countries operate statutory licensing, meaning that licensing is applied according to state legislation, and we have limited control over that licensing, but obviously we will still pay any revenue back to you that's been allocated through that licensing. And others are voluntary. And when they have systems that accommodate this, we provide you with a level of control through PLSE. So what you see on this page is a full list of all of the organisations with whom CLA has a bilateral agreement. Not all of them will have active li licensing at the moment, um, but uh, we're in the process and with CLA very much have a strategy of setting up licensing um, wherever appropriate. In certain, certain circumstances, setting up a, an agreement is really just a precursor of helping them to establish a licensing system, system in, their, in their country. But if we have a look at those sort of variable where you have a level of control, which we can do through the filter, we can click on one of the main uh, RROs where you have a level of control, which is the Copyright Clearance Center in the States. Again, you have the ability to set titles, um, to set pricing for those particular uh, licenses and if I click on any of these licenses I will get a summary of what it's all about and then again the ability to set pricing accordingly. I think one of the things we, 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 we strongly encourage for all of the paper use licenses is that um, as you'll have noticed the default rate will apply um, when you sign an account form uh, to most of these licenses we very much encourage you to set your own pricing uh, to make sure that it's consistent with the value of your publications. And this is strategically, I think, is, is an area that we're really looking to develop over the coming years. We will be launching a couple of new services in this area uh, for Spain through the RRO Cedro and also in Japan with the Document Delivery Service. Uh, and this will be coming online in spring next year. So do keep an eye out through our e-bulletin and through PLSC for those new services that will be available. So let's have a, just a quick recap again before we move on to the final section, which is licensing revenue. So licensing settings means your inclusion in CLA, overseas, and if applicable, NLA licenses. We encourage you to include your titles in all licensing options unless you have very persuasive business uh, case not to do so. Um, if you do and you have concerns, we would certainly encourage you to speak to us before you make any decisions as to include, as to, before you exclude um, from particular licenses. Amber ticks and red crosses are, are an indication that action may be required on your part. And we encourage you to set your own pricing for transactional paper use licenses uh, as appropriate. And then finally, the overseas licensing page shows a comprehensive picture of all RROs or territories covered by your PLS agreement with further options and functionality to come. If you are signed up with NLA, by the way, uh, then this is a different area and I would suggest that you get in contact with us after the presentation and we can talk you through probably on a one-to-one -one basis in terms of how you actually manage uh, your, your uh, title lists and licensing settings in that area because it is quite different to the CLA licensing. So finally, let's have a look at licensing revenue then. Now, we distribute licensing revenue on a monthly basis according to a distribution timetable which is available in your accounts. If I scroll down on, under licensing revenue to distribution timetable, this is where you'll get an overview throughout the year of which sectors we're paying from. NLA will pay out the same uh, sectors every month and they pay out on a monthly basis. For CLA, each distribution will be from a different sector so not from the same sectors each month. And this is why for certain publishers you will see fluctuations through the year month by month because there will be certain sectors that won't apply to you and others that will. Higher education money, for example, is paid out once per year in December. So if you receive money from HE, then next month will be when you should be looking out for revenue. Business is paid out twice. CLA business revenue is paid out twice per year in March and October. 
Whenever we make a payment, we provide full details of that payment through the revenue breakdown section of your account. And this is accessed under licensing revenue, top item at the top. So this provides an itemized breakdown at title level of each of the monthly distributions that, that we make to you. Each distribution will have its own ID. So for example, in October, it was PLS 1082. Clicking on that distribution number will give you an itemized breakdown of all of the titles and the sectors that have been paid out from, um, from that particular payment to you. You can export this information in your desired format here, whether it's Excel, Word, etc. Um, for example, if you need to circulate it to your to your FD, your finance account, uh, your finance department. I'm going to hop down now to the account statement, which provides you with a essentially a rolling statement, like a bank statement, and this will give you the the the, the, the most comprehensive overview of the payments that we've made to you. Each payment will have its own invoice number, beginning with PJI, and this will tally with the invoice number on the remittance advice emails that your designated finance contacts will receive whenever we make a payment to you. If you click on the cross next to the invoice number, this will give you that breakdown, so it will show the gross amount that we've paid to you minus the admin fee and ultimately the amount that you receive. Sometimes you'll see more than one distribution ID under a particular payment, under a particular invoice, if, for example, the amount in a single distribution is below the payment threshold of uh, £25. And then now let's look at revenue dashboards. So the previous two pages were looking at those specific monthly payments that we make to you. The dashboard really gives you that very comprehensive overview of the revenue that you're receiving from PLS. There are three reports on this page. The top report will give you information about your top earning sectors. And if I then click on one of the links on the right hand side, it will give you a really a, a five-year overview of, 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 of your revenue, of the ebbs of, uh, and flows of your revenue. And you can then adjust the parameters in the toolbar at the top to get the information specifically as you need it. So um, you can adjust the date range, the source of revenue. Um, you can select the source by subsector. So that will give you a breakdown, for example, under education of further education, higher education, under government, under central government, local authorities, uh, etc., etc. The second report on the page gives you a different view, I suppose, of, of the revenue that you see, and this is an aggregated view. So I can look at, for example, how much I've received overall from uh, 2014. And again, you've got parameters that you can adjust accordingly. And then the final report will give me information about top earning titles. And again, click on the links, you can adjust the parameters. Now there are a couple of things that it's important to flag on this page. One is, uh, and this is the second use of tagging, you can report on specific groups of titles. So whether it's a particular division that you want to report to, whether it's trying to ascertain whether a particular acquisition has, has brought in additional revenue for you. And if you remember the tag that I set up previously, the history of Britain, if I select that from the tag drop down here, click on view report, this will give you uh, details of just those titles, just like those tag titles that you've identified. And then if I click on one of those titles, I can drill down a level further to get a nice overview of exactly where that money's come from for that, for that particular title. 
And then secondly, all of this information, again, can be exported into Excel, into Word, into PDF, which is quite useful if you're, for example, reporting up, whether it's to a line manager, a finance director, etc. Um, it's, you know, it's another nice feature that, 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 that hopefully helps you to get the best and, and, and really to demonstrate the value of, um, for example, if you're in a permissions team, the value that you're bringing to your organization. Now, as well as licensing revenue, we've got, there are certain sectors, and H, the higher education sector is the main one, where we're able to pro provide a lot more detailed usage data about exactly who's using your content. So on the licensing revenue page, it is more anonymized, so it's simply how much you've been receiving from us. If we go to reports, and we click on higher education scanning data, in this case, for this publisher, um, they don't actually receive money from um, higher education, so this isn't going to give you a, a, a full overview of where uh, of, of the information that we're able to make available. However, I think looking at the column headers here, you can really get a good picture of the granularity of data that we're able to provide. So, it gives you information about the university that's used the work, the course code, the course title, the duration of the course, the number of students, um, the chapter that was reported, um, and, and the precise number of pages that have been used. So if you do receive money from higher education, please do be aware that this section exists. We're going to be revamping it in the new year, so it's going to become a bit more, um, I suppose, promoted via the home page and a bit more visible to you. Um, but, but as I say, please do be aware that this is available to you. And it's certainly the case that where we get other sectors, um, we're always keen to get as much data as, as, as is available that we can then provide to you. If there are other sectors which start making this information available, then be assured we will be making it available through your PLSE account. Okay, so I think we've, we've pretty much reached the end of the, of the webinar. What I wanted to do uh, was just to... I suppose recap some key points to take away. I think everything that I've covered today can be distilled into five key account actions, which if you take nothing, nothing else away, will ensure that your account is set up to get the best out of your relationship with PLS. So number one is to ensure that your titles are fully included in as many licenses as possible. So to check and, and set your own pricing for transactional licenses and to make sure as far as possible that you get green ticks all the way down on the various licenses. Second is to maintain a comprehensive and up-to-date list of your titles, uh, keep us up to date with any sales or acquisitions, and keep an eye out for any items that may require your attention in PLSE Assist. Third is to keep up to date with new licensing opportunities, both through the licensing settings page, um, we're going to be flagging up things through the home page, but also I think crucially through our e-bulletin, we, we really will be making information, um, it, it's something to be aware of that the e-bulletin uh, includes very pertinent information um, most of the time, so do, do keep an eye out, it's usually quite concise and, and, and have a read through when you receive that. The fourth is to actively monitor your licensing revenue from PLS. Um, we're always available to ask questions if you see peaks and troughs. Um, there will be fluctuations with, with, with collective licensing. It is the nature of, of blanket licensing, but we are available to answer questions about that. And also to keep your company and user details up to date. So keep an eye on the people that have access to your account. Obviously, when people leave, it's your responsibility to either remove them from your account or to let us know so that we can do that for you. We've got a team available, um, a, a, a small, friendly, helpful, not hopefully um, we're all very knowledgeable um, on, on all sort of facets of collective licensing. We're available both by email and by phone. Um, hopefully most of you will avail to yourself of, of, of this service um, from time to time. And, you know, I, I can't uh, emphasize more um, that, you know, please do get in touch if you have any questions. To be honest, with collective licensing, no question is, is stupid because we are a very niche area um, and we're, 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 um, yeah, we're available to answer questions whenever they come up. We are going to be taking questions in a second, um, but I'd just like to end by thank, just to say thank you for listening. 
Um, and um, yeah, we'll move on to the questions. Okay, so give me a second. I'm just going to have a look at the questions that we've got. Okay, so the first question, let me, sorry, let me see. So one question we've had is what does it mean to opt into digital? What we mean by digital is content. So we don't talk, we're not talking about digital usage here, we're talking about your digital titles. So it's going to be your ebooks, your e-journals, or your websites. And Opting in to a particular license means that um, that is opting in, for, certainly for, for CLA licenses, it's opting in um, all of your digital content minus any titles that you wish to exclude. And digital is really extension of the, of the existing license terms. So previously it was all print, it was all photocopying use. In 2008-2009, we introduced digital repertoire to the license, subject very much to the same terms of, that, of those licenses. Um, and in many ways, it's to, I think, probably one of the most fundamental uh, reasons for, for opting in digital is to keep the license relevant. Uh, we, CLA was certainly hearing from their licensees that, you know, if it just covers f uh, photocopying use, then uh, particularly in, 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 in business government sectors um, where much more is, is, is moving into digital, um, were it just to include print and photocopying, um, the value of the license or even, even the justification for having the license would quickly be eroded and we'd be in danger of losing licensing altogether. So, um, so it would be opting in your, your e-books, your e-journals and, um, and, and, and your websites but it would be very much according to the, the strict terms and conditions which you will see if you drill down into the license and get through to the license terms and conditions um, which are available from the CLA website. That will show you precisely what the limitations are on, on what, what licensees are able to do with your digital content. In terms of the uh, potential impacts of opting your, in your digital titles. Um, this will vary from publisher to publisher. I mean, I, 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 I think the main thing to emphasize, emphasize is that there was an extended consultation when digital was being considered as being um, something uh, to introduce to the license. Uh, we've got several publishers on our board. Um, we're um, beholden effectively to the trade associations, to the publishers association, the periodical publisher. Uh, sorry, Professional Publishers Association and the Association of Learned and Professional Society Publishers. Um, every change to the license, particularly one of this significance, uh, needs to go through a detailed consultation um, uh, process. It did so, um, and I think all of the, the parties involved were satisfied that the, 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 the license terms were restrictive enough so that they would not impact on publishers' primary sales. And, uh, you know, I think one of the, the central tenets of, 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 and principles of, of collective licensing is to do no harm. We, we must not make, sh we must make sure that, that any license terms will not impinge upon pr publishers' primary business. Um, so hopefully that, that, that answers the question in a, uh, a, at a high level. Clearly, um, if there are questions, um, beyond this, we'd be very happy to talk through the detail and to, to involve CLA um, as appropriate. Okay, another question is if we have a direct agreement with CCC, uh, should CCC have a green tick in the overseas licensing list? The way this will work is that if you have a direct agreement with CCC, that will always take precedence over uh, any settings that we have uh, that you have through your PLS ac account, and indeed, most uh, publishers that have a direct agreement will, will generally still be opted in to the CCC uh, license through PLSC. All it will mean is that CCC will ignore any settings um, that they receive from uh, from PLS via CLA, 
um, and, and as I say, your director agreement will take precedence. What will sometimes happen is that maybe titles, very old titles that aren't included in your opt-in list to CCC, which will come via PLS. So in that respect, opting into uh, and, and participating in the CCC license through PLSC uh, is it provides a sort of belt and braces approach, I guess, um, uh, in, 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 in that respect. Okay, um, can, another question is, can we confirm that publishers have to add titles? Are these not obtained via Nielsen, the Nielsen database? We don't get a direct feed from Nielsen. We use Nielsen on, on, on a, um, an ad hoc sort of on, uh, as required basis. And, and one of the main reasons for this is that we consider publishers primary data, publishers to be the primary and most reliable source of data. Um, we have had instances where Nielsen uh, ownership data may disagree with, um, with, with, with the data that we, we get from the publisher. And because the stakes are very high, because uh, effectively we're paying out um, significant amounts of revenue based on the data that we hold in our system, um, we would prefer to receive the data, and, and it was effectively a policy decision to um, consider the publisher repertoire that, and title list that we get from you to take primacy over anything that we get from Nielsen. I think there are various questions about whether a recorded version will be available, and I think Suzanne's already answered that, but yes, absolutely, we, we are recording this session and we will make it available. Okay, another question, to what depth should individual articles, uh, titles be included when a magazine, in this case a bi-monthly, is registered? Perhaps the ISSN is sufficient. Yes, the answer is the ISSN is absolutely sufficient. At the moment, licensing is conducted at uh, title level. Um, in, in certain, we are developing in, uh, for certain licenses the ability to report at article level. Uh, so, for example, for the new second extract permission service for higher education, we're intending to make uh, the chapter available and the DOI, for example, uh, where, where, where appropriate and available um, so that you get that level of granularity in your reporting. But yes, absolutely, um, what we need is the, is, the, is the title rather than anything more granular in terms of the, um, the information that you add to PLSE. And the final question I think we have is, is we're not publishing ebooks yet, but we publish PDFs. Would we be able to add these titles as digital, even if their equivalent in hard copy was already added? It's a good question. Um, I think providing we've got the, the, the ISBN, it really depends on whether the title, the, the, the PDFs will have their own identifier, because for example, if a a licensee copied from a PDF and it wasn't clear what the particular publication was because it didn't have an ISBN or an ISSN, um, then it may be difficult for the CLA's data validation team to uh, identify uh, who, who the publisher was. We are looking at ways, because at the moment our, our, our distributions policy is based on the premise that we will only pay out to titles that have an ISBN or an ISSN or, or a URL. Um, one thing, and we're looking at ways in which we can um, perhaps set up a, 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 our own internal identifier or use our own inter internal identifier to allocate to titles that don't have identifiers, but um, really in this case it's a question of watch this space because we, we are working on this at the moment. Um, one thing you could do is uh, tick both the print and digital box for um, those publications that are all also available in digital format. Um, this will mean that um, when the data is being validated, um, there is, um, it, it, it makes it easier for them to say, okay, this is a digital version, but we know um, it's in the database with this title, therefore we will allocate to that title. So that's probably the, the, the most appropriate workaround at the moment. Okay, I think um, I think those are all the questions that we've received, and, and thank you very much for engaging. Um, it is really really useful to have those questions coming through, and hopefully it's it's helped other people. I think we have a last minute question actually coming coming through. Um, 
when overseas publishers ask to reprint our articles, what do we send them um, to regarding licensing? Reprints uh, is, 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 is slightly different, I think, because um, effectively they are, um, in a way, it's, it's potentially primary licensing for you. It would be reprinting. Uh, it could be something that you can license directly. Um, we do have a service called PLS Clear, which we're currently developing. Um, and we can pass you details afterwards about that. Uh, my colleague Jonathan Griffin is, is, is overseeing that. That may be something that, 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 that has relevance to that question um, and we can, we can take this offline and, and get back to you on that. And one more, uh, let's just come in. So should each, quest, should each issue I bring out six a year be registered or again is the ISSN enough? If the ISSN covers each individual issue, then ISSN is perfectly sufficient, yep, yeah, and we wouldn't require. The, the exception to that, I suppose, is if it's in a series and you have an ISSN plus ISBNs um, uh, are issued for each individual volume, then ideally we'd like the ISBNs as well, um, but otherwise the ISSN is perfectly sufficient. Webinars for PLS Clear, yes, definitely. Um, I think it's something that we've got we've got planned. This was for, this was the first webinar I think that we've we've done. Um, we're certainly um, intending to, to to do webinars across the board for various other PLS initiatives, and I think given the success of this one, it's it's something that we'll definitely be be be, be doing. How do you how do you know what to set your copyright prices at? Good question. Um, we are very careful. We're not able to provide information about the price that you should apply for the various paper use services due to competition uh, reasons. Um, one thing you can do is uh, rough and ready way of doing it is to calculate the uh, the number of pages in your in your work, uh, how much you, it sells for, and then divide by the number of pages. Um, but but if you if you would like more information about that, do get in touch with one of our team again, and we will um, we we will help you with that, and we can take that offline. And the last question, I think we've got. Okay, I think that was the last question I'm being told. So um, again, thank you very much for for, for listening. Um, and um, yeah, if any other questions occur after the webinar, please do get in touch with one of our team, and we'd be delighted to to help you. So thank you very much.